Hugh White, what would a new Australian way of war look like? Well, the old Australian way of war, which we're all very familiar with, is that we um, raise an army and send it overseas to support our great and powerful friends where they're fighting for shared values and interests wherever in the world they might be threatened, from Gallipoli or the Western Front to the Middle East to Iraq or Afghanistan or Vietnam or Korea. And I don't knock it, it served us pretty well. But I don't think that way of war works for us when we no longer have a great and powerful friend to defend us. The reason that old Australian way of war worked was because we felt that what we needed to do to secure ourselves was, was whatever it took both to, to help preserve our great and powerful allies' presence as the leading power in Asia and to help preserve their commitment to using that power for our defence. And so when, for example, we went to war in the, the Middle East, uh, in Gallipoli and, and the Western Front in 1914, 1918, it wasn't just because we felt ourselves to be sons of empire, but we did. It was that we realised that our security from Japan depended on Britain not being defeated in Northern Europe. And so that, that, that model worked well for us. But today, in an era in which Australia, I would argue, can no longer depend on a great and powerful friend, when our new way of war needs to focus on being able to defend the continent independently from a major Asian power, then the idea that the best thing for us to do is to deploy our land forces overseas is seriously out of date. And yet it still has a big place in Australian thinking. In fact, as Australian defence policy makers have slowly and reluctantly and kind of covertly started to think about how you reshape Australia's defence policy to meet the challenge to American leadership in Asia posed by China, the idea which has floated almost spontaneously to the surface is that we should expand our capacity for expeditionary land operations in the Asia Pacific in support of the United States. And that is, so far as I can see, the rationale for the massive investments in the big amphibious ships, um, uh, the LHDs, and the massive investment in major surface combatants, uh, particularly the future frigates uh, and the air warfare destroyers. Um, and I think that's a big mistake for two reasons. The first is, three reasons. The first is I, I don't think the Americans are going to be there to fight the war for us. So building our forces to support them doesn't make much sense. The second is that with or without American support, our capacity to safely deploy land forces overseas and bring them back again if we have to and supply them when they're there. In other words, our capacity to achieve the sea control required to deploy forces by sea uh, is very, very doubtful in the face of the kind of maritime capabilities that China or any other substantial regional adversary would deploy. Now, there's a, an underlying argument there about the balance between offence and defence at sea, uh, which I explain in a chapter in the book, but the, but the heart of it is simply this, that, that uh, it's much, much easier to find and sink an adversary's ships than it is to stop an adversary finding and sinking your ships. And that means that for Australia to try and achieve the levels of sea control required to deploy in our ground forces overseas will be extraordinarily difficult and I think practically impossible against a major Asian power adversary. Uh, and so that's not going to work. Thirdly, even if we did achieve that kind of sea control, all we do is deposit our army into a battlefield, a continental land battlefield somewhere in Asia in which it would more or less be, by definition, be outnumbered and outgunned. Australia, with the best will in the world, is always going to have the smallest serious army in Asia. And the idea that we can, as a country, achieve decisive strategic effects by fighting essentially continental conflicts with land forces, I, I think is well, I, I think it's implausible. And I've never seen a successful argument, even an attempt at a successful argument, as to why we should do it. People say we should do it because that's what we've always done. Well, yes, but circumstances were different back then. So I put it to you then that your bumper sticker your bumper sticker is Fortress Australia, but with a long air and naval reach. Yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't much favour the phrase Fortress Australia, but the basic proposition of the primary task of the Australian Defence Force, the key strategic objective, as I, is the phrase I use, uh, 
is to defend the continent and the most cost effective way of doing that is to prevent an adversary projecting power by sea towards us. But it's also worth noting that, that the good news for Australia is that it's not just that we're an island, we're surrounded by islands. All of our neighbours are islands. So we can do a lot to keep an adversary far from our shores by, by um, denying access to the maritime approaches of our neighbours as well as to our own continent. So a, a strategy of maritime denial, which is the new Australian way of war that I propose, is one that doesn't just give us options for defending the continent in a sort of fortress Australia way, it also gives us options for preventing changes in the regional strategic environment which would make it harder for us to defend the continent uh, if, uh, if push came to shove. So it, it's, it's, it is a, a more expansive conception of Australia's strategic objectives than the old Fortress Australia concept. Apart from New Zealand though, this is a form of armed neutrality because uh, much as you'd like say an alliance with Indonesia, you also muse in the book about Indonesia as a foe. So it's Fortress Australia and versions of armed neutrality? Well, um, it's not necessarily armed neutrality. Um, because we'd have the capability uh, within the capacity to defend the continent itself to um, also help our, our neighbours defend themselves uh, from uh, attempts to project force by sea against them, we have the capacity to be a valued coalition partner uh, and that m m provides the foundation for an effective alliance. I don't think for a moment that we can take it for granted that, for example, Indonesia is going to be an ally. Um, uh, I think that the, the kind of idea that, you know, the, the very deeply embedded Australia strategic culture that we have permanent alliances, you know, people who are our deep mates on the basis of shared values and history and culture and all the rest of it. Well, maybe that was true of the British and the Americans, though I think it's in a, an inadequate explanation of the way those alliances worked but it's certainly not going to be true, say, of Indonesia. And I mean, Indonesia is a very important special case because it's the only country which is a um, big country, close enough to, to attack us directly from its own territory, but it's also the only big country close enough to be much use in helping us to defend our immediate neighbourhood. So Indonesia has, as the 1976 white paper famously said, always going to have the characteristics both of a strategic asset and a strategic liability. Now the challenge to Australian diplomacy is to make sure that it's an asset, not a liability. Australian defence policy has to accommodate both possibilities. A good defence policy is one that allows us to defend ourselves against Indonesia if it turns out to be a liability, and to work with Indonesia to secure our wider neighbourhood if we are smart enough and lucky enough uh, for that to be possible. The Fortress Australia mentality is, is based on no longer trusting the US, it's based on a fear of China, and it factors in the possibilities of a, of a hostile India or a hostile Indonesia. How then does Australia have any role in the regional order, if that's where it starts from? Because no one's going to want to line up with an Australia that's essentially building the forces to defend against them. I don't see Australia's choices that way. Um, I do think it's extremely important for Australia to, to do whatever it can to help to contribute to the construction of a stable regional order in which the risk of threats to us is minimised. And I think we could have been doing that. We could have been doing a lot more to do that in the last decade had we not been so fixated on the idea that American primacy was going to be sustained indefinitely. That, that, that mantra which Australian political leaders on both sides of politics have, in, have you know, repeated so often, we don't have to choose between America and China. If you look at the logic underlying that statement, it's pretty clear. We don't have to choose between America and China because of China and the United States won't really be strategic rivals because America is too powerful and they'll persuade the Chinese to back off. Now, you know, it, is, it has taken a very long time, even if it's happened now, for Australian political leaders to take seriously the fact that a new order in Asia is emerging and we ought to be trying to shape that order. And as long as we take it for granted that the old order will somehow be preserved, we will make no contribution to that. So we should absolutely be doing whatever we can to shape that order. But can we shape that order if we set out uh, a, a set of defence choices which are about Australia defending itself against Asia, not an Australia which is saying we are going to come and help you we are going to set up a defence force to defend ourselves against you. Yes, well, I, th I, th I think you can because, of course, it's not a matter of setting up a defence force to defend ourselves against Asia. 
because it's not just Asia we're talking mm. about. It's a very complex strategic system with China and India and Indonesia and Japan and other Southeast Asian countries. And the challenge for us is to, well, to paraphrase dear old Lord Palmerston, no permanent friends or permanent enemies, only permanent interests. It's going to be a pretty fluid show. At times our interests are going to be aligning with some countries, at times with others. But the idea that you can, so to speak, uh, ab initio, divide the region into friends and enemies and that you build your defence forces against the enemies and you work with the friends and that those two categories are predetermined, I don't think, I don't think works. I think we're going to be in a region where we, we are going to face the possibility of, of a conflict with a very wide range of countries and the possibility of cooperation with a very wide range of countries. So just as the British throughout their strategic history up until the 19th century would align with the French and the Germans against the Spanish, then the Spanish and the French against the Germans, and the Ru you got it. They, they align with everybody against everybody at different times in their history, and often very quickly. It's going to be more like that. So I don't think there's any inconsistency with building a strong defence force which can perform those basic strategic objectives, defend the continent, support the security of our immediate neighbours, and so on. Um, but we do want to be very careful in the way we do it. Obviously, you don't want to build a force which looks more threatening to others than it needs to. And one of the advantages of my conception of a new Australian way of war, a military strategy of maritime denial, is that it is inherently, although it's operationally quite offensive, you're going out to find and sink ships, strategically it's very defensive. You're preventing other people projecting power by sea. It's a less threatening posture than the power projection posture which our defence force is drifting towards at the moment. Let's finish this by trying to give you a label that you might, in, you might embrace. If you don't want to call it Fortress Australia, I was thinking about what label you could put to the Hugh yes. White Doctrine. Uh, and I thought about Singapore, which uh, had the poison prawn idea, yes. the prawn yes. too poisonous yes. to swallow. And I thought perhaps maybe we're talking about Hugh White's giant pineapple strategy. <laughs> uh, the continent which is too sharp yeah. and too tough to yeah. bite. Well, it, it's, I'm, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure about the, about the analogy but, uh, as far as the fruit is concerned, but I do think the basic proposition we need to think about is how do we raise the costs and risks of a major power adversary, and not necessarily China. You know, if we look ahead decades, it could be one of the others. But how do we raise the costs and risks to a major power that seeks to use military force against us to the point where they just decide it's not worth their while? I mean, that's what victory looks like to a middle power like Australia against a great power. We're not going to we're not going to march down, uh, march the Australian um, regular army across Tiananmen Square, um, nor no, no, no down the main street of Delhi or Jakarta. Uh, victory for us is simply is a little bit like the Finns in the Winter War. It's simply a matter of imposing costs and risks to the point that the other guy just says, well, that's all too hard. Now, I don't think that's impossible, but it's, it, it certainly can be done. And so, yes, to that extent, it does look a bit like a pineapple. Hugh White, thank you. My pleasure.